Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Jillian Prescott Memorial Lecture that's being presented as part of the Florida Historical Society 2021 Virtual Public History Forum. And I want to welcome all of the people around the world who are watching this via our website at myfloridahistory.org. And also, it's so wonderful to have a live audience here uh, for the first time in more than a year at the Library of Florida History in Cocoa. And in fact, to talk with you here, we are masked and socially distanced, uh, which is a, uh, a great thing because while the light is at the end of the COVID-19 tunnel, we aren't quite there yet, uh, but we wanted to get our feet wet with this kind of hybrid event. And, and we're so happy to, to have you here. I'm looking around the room and we have people here from as far away as Tallahassee and St. Augustine, uh, Orlando, uh, Melbourne, all over Brevard County but uh, from around the state too, Apopka. So uh, we've, we've got quite a, quite a good audience here live and it's so great to have you uh, here at the Library of Florida History. Uh, this is the statewide headquarters of the Florida Historical Society. Uh, the Florida Historical Society was established in 1856, making us the oldest existing cultural organization in the state. Here at the Library of Florida History, which is an old 1939 WPA era post office, we have our archive and we have thousands of rare and out of print books. We have uh, maps upstairs dating back to the 1500s. We have about 20,000 historic postcards, uh, all sorts of historic photographs and genealogical information, all sorts of uh, primary source materials for researchers, uh, historians and other researchers. And uh, Holly Baker, who's sitting in the back there and greeted many of you, uh, she is our public history coordinator and archivist here at the Library of Florida History. So if you want any, to use any of our resources, you can contact Holly. We are still by, uh, doing research by appointment only here, but uh, she's always available by email or, or phone. The Florida Historical Quarterly is the scholarly publication of the Florida Historical Society, and this year we are going to be publishing our 100th volume of that academic journal. And uh, the editor of the Florida Historical Quarterly is here in our audience, Connie Lester, and we're looking forward to the 100th volume. The Florida Historical Society Press is also an operation of FHS, and we've got nearly 100 titles now uh, under the Florida Historical Society Press banner, uh, diverse uh, titles about a wide variety of Florida history and culture topics. One of them uh, is Palmetto Country, which is a classic Florida book. It was originally written in 1942 by Stetson Kennedy. In the late 1930s and early 1940s, Stetson Kennedy went all around the state of Florida, uh, collecting oral histories and documenting the culture of what even then was a very diverse community in Florida. He talked with cigar workers in, in Tampa and African-American turpentine still workers and cracker cowboys and, and uh, people all over the state representing our diverse population, and he documented that. Uh, his book, Palmetto Country, was a classic, but it hadn't been in print for, for quite some time, so we were very happy to get that book back in print and added about 80 new photographs uh, to the book. Uh, so that's just one example of, of one of the hundreds, of, uh, nearly 100 titles that we have. And, and actually, uh, Sandra Parks, who was married to Stetson Kennedy, is, is here today as well. Uh, one of our most recent titles I, I want to plug is a, uh, is a novel. Now, you, you would expect that we would publish nonfiction books, but we also publish novels that have a solid base in Florida history and culture. And uh, one of those is What We Have Endured, a novel of the Seminole Wars by John and Mary Lou Missile, who are Seminole War historians, and, uh, but also they collaborated with Willie Johns, who is an historian with the Seminole tribe, was a historian, he, he died late last year, but he was a, an historian with the Seminole tribe of Florida, and this is a story of the Seminole War from the Seminole perspective, which is different and we thought was important to capture. So again, just, just one of many books uh, that we have, and we invite you to peruse our bookstore since you're here live, and, and uh, you can look online. The people who are watching via our website can find all of our books online at myfloridahistory.org as well. Uh, part of what we do too is the Florida Historical Society Archaeological Institute. And for well over a century, the Florida Historical Society has been involved in the, the preservation and the documentation of archaeological work throughout the state. 
And more recently, the Florida Historical Society Archaeological Institute has been holding uh, presentations by archaeologists from around the state, not over the past year, but in the past we have, publishing books as well. But our main thing is publishing the, the Adventures in Florida Archaeology, which is a full color magazine. Uh, we've been doing that for uh, about six years now, I believe, and it, uh, it is a, a beautiful magazine, and it's uh, co-edited by uh, K.C. Smith, one of our Florida Historical Society board members who is, is also here. A brand new issue is, is on the stands, so uh, we're happy about that. Also, the Florida Historical Society manages the historic Rossiter House Museum and Gardens down in O'Galley. And the last resident of that house was Carrie Rossiter, who in uh, 1921, at the age of 23, uh, took over her father's Standard Oil Agency uh, in Brevard County and on what would become the Space Coast. Uh, he, he died, she, you know, this was when women had just received the right to vote a few months earlier, but she wanted to take over the business. As a young woman, she went up to Kentucky where the, the Standard Oil Board of Directors met. As the story goes, she listened at the keyhole as they argued about whether or not to let her run her father's business. And finally, somebody said, oh, let the little lady have it. She'll fail in a year and we'll give it to a man. Well, uh, she didn't last a year, she lasted 62 years as, as head of the local Standard Oil Agency, one of the most successful uh, in, in the nation. And uh, in fact, we have a letter, a, a handwritten note from Ronald Reagan congratulating her upon her retirement. Uh, so uh, she was quite something and our historic Rossiter House Museum and Gardens is operated by our uh, great staff there. It's Barbara West, Angela McHugh, and Tim Carroll help uh, run and maintain, give historic tours at that museum. Perhaps our most expansive educational outreach program, one of our most successful efforts, are our media programs. We produce and host and distribute Florida Frontiers, the weekly radio magazine of the Florida Historical Society on NPR affiliates throughout the state. Uh, we also uh, produce the public television series, Florida Frontiers, which airs on PBS affiliates around the state. And it airs at different times uh, uh, on those affiliates, but you can find it all over the state. And if you're watching online at myfloridahistory.org, you can access every program, all of our radio programs and all of our television programs are also online at myfloridahistory.org. And of course, the same goes for our live audience. If, it, if they're on at a time where you can't see them, you can certainly, you can watch them at your convenience or stream them from our website. But, uh, and well, I wanna mention John White, our director of media production, who is of course where he should be right there behind the camera. And also Jerry Klein, he's not in the, in the room, but he is helping with these, all of this production as well. He was, uh, he's one of our great volunteers, was volunteer of the year uh, of F for FHS uh, recently. So, uh, without further ado, I want to get to our Jillian Prescott Memorial Lecture, and Gilbert King is coming to us from his home in Brooklyn, and uh, Gilbert King is a Pulitzer Prize winning author. I'm sure most of you are familiar with his work. Uh, he is the author of Devil in the Grove, Thurgood Marshall, and the Dawn of a New America. He's also author of the book, Beneath a Ruthless Sun, A True Story of Violence, Race, and Justice Lost and Found. He's also written about race and criminal justice for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Atlantic. And as you can see over there, we have his books uh, available uh, for sale. Uh, if you would like to pick one up after, or both of them up, after he uh, gives us his, his presentation. Also, you will have the chance, our live audience here will have the chance to interact with Gilbert King when he's done with this presentation. And what you'll do if you have a question, just stand up, come and we've got some tape on the floor here. Just stand right here, talk directly to this uh, little camera right here where the red light is and, and Gilbert King will see you. In fact, he's seeing all of us right now. So he, he can see all of us. And uh, so you can ask him your questions. So as he is presenting, uh, think about what you'd like to ask Gilbert King. And uh, thank you for being here. And uh, uh, take it away, Gilbert King. Thanks. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Or Dr. Bookmark. Oh, I really appreciate it. It's such a such a pleasure to be virtually here at Florida Historical Historical Society. 
my, my biggest regret is that I'm not there with you guys now. I, I haven't been to Florida in over a year now. Um, and, you know, obviously because of COVID and everything, but uh, it's been a great disappointment. It's also made me realize how much I really miss Florida. I've been holed up here in Brooklyn, New York, and talking to, I'm working on a project and talking to so many Floridians for this project, it's just not quite the same. Uh, I really need to get back down there and, and I'm working on that probably within the next couple of weeks. So I wish I was there with you and interacting with you in person, but um, we're, we're getting close to that date, I think. So um, um, so I'm gonna start out by talking, um, I'll give you a little bit of historical context of the 1940s. I, start, I started out Devil in the Grove, the very first chapter begins in 1946, um, it's right after World War II, just sort of showing what the Jim Crow South uh, was really like in that era that we call like the pre-civil rights era. Um, so these are the years after World War II, but before the civil rights movement of the 60s. And I think it's kind of a, a blank spot in American history in a lot of ways. I don't think, you know, the American narrative, um, it doesn't really allow a lot of room um, to, to cover some of the, the, the um, civil rights history that I think really should be talked about. We generally like to move the narrative, um, you know, it started with the Emancipation Proclamation, get into the Reconstruction era, and then and there's like a darkness, it kind of goes quiet again, and we realize that, you know, there's a Jim Crow era, of course, but we really don't know much about that as a country, and I think there's a reason we don't know much about it, is because it's a really painful narrative. Well, Americans, we like to talk about issues with hope, and so you know, Abraham Lincoln gave hope. And so that's, that's sort of um, uh, one of the things that historians like to focus on and people like to read about. Then there's that period, you know, reconstruction, really all the way up until the 1960s that I think in terms of civil rights, uh, not as well known. Uh, and, and so I think the, the era that's leading right up to the civil rights movement in a lot of ways became one of the most violent, uh, most oppressive and disenfranchising uh, times after Reconstruction. And, and so I want to just talk about that a little bit, and, and, and I'll ease you into this, the Florida story aspect of this, and we'll go through this. And then I'll definitely leave a lot of room for questions at the end, because I notice whenever I do my talks, whether they're live or virtually, I always get the best questions from Florida audiences. And in fact, I, I learn so much because sometimes people will bring up um, areas of history that I didn't even know about and, and I'll go back and look into it. And, and so it, it's a great relationship that I've had um, over the years uh, speaking to Florida audiences. So um, if I could just switch over, I'm gonna share screen. Um, so I'm, I'm talking a little bit about 1946. And I think it's really important to understand what the NAACP looked like because they were heavily involved in this Groveland case. And you can see here's a photograph of Thurgood Marshall and his staff of lawyers at the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund. And I think what I really like about this photograph most is that you can see two women in the center there and they are not the paralegals. They are not the administrative staff for the male lawyers. They are actually attorneys themselves. Uh, and that was pretty remarkable because this was at a time where not a lot of big law firms in Washington DC and, and uh, New York City were hiring uh, female attorneys. Uh, but, but Thurgood Marshall had no problem with that. In fact, if you see on the right, uh, there's a photograph um, uh, pictured is, is Constance Baker Motley. Uh, Thurgood Marshall hired her right out of law school and she went on to become a federal judge and a, a great figure in civil rights. But she, she talked about you know, the interview process, meeting Thurgood Marshall right out of law school. And she, she basically recalled Marshall just telling a few jokes and talking a little bit about law school. And, and then he hired her on the spot. And, and so Constance Baker Motley later on in her autobiography said that Thurgood Marshall was really the first feminist of law because he was giving women lawyers opportunities that they didn't really have anywhere else. Um, and I like to look at this photograph um, of these five staff attorneys at the NACP's Legal Defense Fund. And I really think that these are really, you're looking at the best and the brightest. Um, at the time when they were arguing these civil rights cases before the Supreme Court, uh, their record was impeccable. They won just about every single case they argued. Um, and, and they were pretty much like a dream team. When it came to 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment law, uh, this group right here is definitely who you wanted on your side. Um, you know, you, if you look in this photograph, there's um, 
three federal judges, a high ranking uh, a member or official with the Department of Justice and a US ambassador. So ultimately, even after working at the NAACP, they all went on to have these really gloried careers uh, in, in law. Um, and, and I think I think this just photograph just sort of sums up the, the spirit, I think, of, of, of what was happening in the time and, and how uh, these men and women were really going off to battle. Uh, and, and one of the things you, you'd see in a lot of situations is Thurgood Marshall himself would often get on the train by himself. He said, armed only with a piece of paper, the US Constitution. And he would often go down to the Jim Crow South, again, by himself, and show up in court. Um, you know, some of them he was working on, obviously, the landmark cases of the 20th century in terms of civil rights. We're talking about voting rights, uh, housing cases, school desegregation cases. But one of the things that interested me most, I think, as a writer, was that Thurgood Marshall also was going down south to take these death penalty cases. Um, and usually they involved one man or a group of men who were falsely accused of sexual assault. Um, and, and that was one of the things that Thurgood Marshall and his lawyers could do. They could come in and defend these men. A lot of times following World War II, there were, you know, there was a wave of soldier lynchings in the summer of 1946. And Thurgood Marshall and his lawyers were wanting to get involved in this, but there was very little that they could do because they, they couldn't really force prosecution. Uh, so what they really did was just sort of make sure that there was a great awareness about these atrocities that were being commit, committed following World War II. Uh, they could provide support to the communities, put political pressure, media pressure, but they were sort of limited as to how much they could engage in these kind of cases. Um, and oftentimes those cases, you know, if there were even any indictments for a lynching, uh, oftentimes they were, there was never a conviction. Uh, and, and so Marshall and his lawyers really wanted to get involved. Uh, but what ended up really attracting their attention was following World War II, you saw a, a, a big drop off in lynchings in the United States. Um, it, it happened even earlier uh, before World War II. But what was really beginning to happen in the United States was there was less of a taste for lynchings. They were, they were just seeing it becoming more and more as they got more publicity, becoming more abhorrent to the uh, American conscience. And so what ended up happening was you saw the lynchings really plummet in the United States uh, and, and it was replaced by something else. And that was the death penalty. Um, and it was being used um, in, in, in probably the most racist way. I mean, if you look around at the states, um, back back in the 40s and 50s and even into the 60s, um, sexual assault or rape was considered uh, uh, a capital case. Uh, so it was punishable by the death penalty. And, and when, when historians and, and academics go back and look at these cases, they were able to find that this was the most, uh, of all crimes, this was the most racially prosecuted. Uh, and you'd see the numbers of uh, Virginia, I think, prosecuted 49 death penalty cases for rape. In every single one of those 49 cases, um, the, the defendant was an African-American and the victim or alleged victim in a lot of cases was white. You would never see um, a white person face the death penalty uh, for the rape of a white woman. And in the same way that um, if African-Americans were defendants in a case against a black woman, it would not become a death penalty case. The only way these cases became death penalty cases in the South was when they were being perceived as sort of protecting uh, the mixing of the races. And that's why you see it was the most unjust prosecuted crime. And Thurgood Marshall recognized that a lot of times in communities, um, innocent men were being charged with these crimes. And it was a way of sort of housekeeping that started with, you know, a very strong sheriff in a community or a prosecutor or, or the, you know, the claims. Uh, they, they happened in a lot of different cases. And Florida had, you know, Rosewood sort of began that way where, you know, the next thing you know, you have a total exodus of the entire black community from, from Rosewood. Uh, and, and so th these were some of the factors that were happening in the South. And some, of the, some of the reasons that Thurgood Marshall would get on those trains by himself and travel down South. 
The story I'm going to walk you through begins in Lake County. Uh, uh, back in 1949, a young woman by the name of Norma Paget and her husband, Willie Paget. Um, she was 17. He was a little bit older than her at the time. Uh, rumors were going around town that Willie had gotten physical with his wife and there was a separation. Uh, and so even though Norma Paget was married at the age of 17, uh, she was quickly separated um, and the family sort of got involved because they didn't think this was turning out to be a very mature match. Um, but by the summer of 1949, uh, Willie Paget sort of wanted to get things going again with his wife, a second chance, I guess you could say. And so he asked her out on a date um, and picked up some whiskey and they went out dancing in Lake County. And on their way home from uh, this, uh, I think it was American Legion Lodge in Claremont, uh, they were driving down a road heading towards to get a late night um, snack or something. And apparently they had some car problems. Something happened on the side of the road we're not really quite sure exactly what, but one thing we do know is that by the morning, uh, Norma Paget had made these accusations that she had been abducted and sexually assaulted by four African Americans in Lake County. Um, and what you can see here in this photograph is um, Life Magazine sent a photographer down to Lake County the following day. Um, none of these photographs I'm gonna show you were ever published, um, but I found them in what they call a dead file. Um, but it's sort of interesting because it's a photographer was sent down to Lake County in the immediate aftermath of Norma Paget's claims, and he was able to document this investigation in real time, so to speak. And so here you can see the Lake County Sheriff Willis McCall and his trademark White Stetson, and he's surveying the damage here in, in, in Groveland in, in, in the black community of Stucky Still where houses have been targeted by the Klan. Ku Klux Klan rolled into Lake County by the hundreds and began burning down um, these homes in, in a, a section called Stucky Still. Um, you can see um, to the left, the prosecutor, state attorney, um, Jesse Hunter, and uh, to the right is a deputy named James Yates. And they're surveying the damage from the night before. And Willis McCall is telling the photographer what happened and you know, he's walking the photographer through the ruins here. What, what he doesn't tell him is that the night before, Willis McCall was actually at the scene and basically field directing the Klan as to which houses to burn down. Um, so that we learned later through the records. But as far as this photographer knew, he was just showing up with law enforcement to look at the damage of the Klan. And this sort of speaks to the, the blurring of the lines and, and the mixing uh, between the Ku Klux Klan uh, and, and law enforcement. And this is something that Stetson Kennedy had been writing about for a very long time, um, which is a really interesting way to look at what was happening in the South a lot of times. It, you know, uh, in fact, Stetson Kennedy said something to me which uh, really resonated when I met him, boy, maybe 15 years ago. Uh, he said, you know, it, when you look at white supremacy in the South, it's just a changing of the uniforms. It started out with the, you know, Confederate uniform, um, then it switches over to the hood and the robe of the Klan. And then when that is, is becoming unacceptable, there's a new uniform that comes into place and that's the uniform of law enforcement. And that's what you really see when you look at the 40s and 50s especially, um, is this mixing between law enforcement and the Klan. Um, and and I, I've talked to some deputies in Lake County who are alive and on, you know, on McCall's force and, and they told me, you know, what they could not accomplish through the law, they would just accomplish later on through the Klan. Uh, and so that mixing really plays a really important role in this story and many stories in the Jim Crow South. Um, the violence got so bad in Lake County that the, um, the uh, National Guard had to be uh, called in, the Florida National Guard. And you can see them stationed out here with, you know, machine guns. And basically what they're doing, and this was something that the, the citrus barons uh, understood, um, they could not really afford a mass exodus of labor. Um, they had seen something like this happen in Rosewood where there were these accusations and then an exodus of African-Americans from the community. And then suddenly you have a, you've lost your black labor force. Um, and the citrus the barons were counting on African-American laborers to provide um, to basically be pickers in the groves. And 
they didn't want a repeat of Rosewood. So they really were, you know, I wouldn't say they were necessarily racially enlightened, but they knew that they had to protect their economic interests. And that really required some kind of help. And so you see the National Guard coming in, you see um, these uh, citrus barons using their own trucks to transport African-Americans to safety away from the Klan. Uh, and so that was something that, that happened in Florida. That, that was an interesting development that sort of went against what you would normally see, I think, in the South. Um, shortly after uh, Norma Paget made these accusations, uh, three of what would later become known as the Groveland Four were arrested. And here's a photograph of Walter Urban, Charles Greenlee, and Sam Shepard um, standing between a jailer and Sheriff Willis McCall. Um, interestingly enough, I um, only received this photograph a couple of months ago. Um, somebody wrote me um, uh, by the name of Jim Wetz and his father, Eddie, was a staff photographer at the Mount Door Topic. And uh, he was going through uh, his father's old materials and he found this and he said, oh, I should send that to that author. So I had never seen this photograph before until a few months ago. And it ran in the, it ran in the Mount Dora Topic uh, cropped. But, but here you see the, the, the photograph of the what would later become the defendants. What's interesting about this photograph is it was taken um, not too long after these defendants were arrested, taken into the basement of the Lake County Courthouse and beaten so severely. They had welts all over their body, um, bruises, uh, teeth were knocked out um, to get what Willis McCall called the confessions. Um, and later on, he stood on the courthouse steps and held up some blank pieces of paper that said, I'm holding in my hand uh, the confessions from three of the suspects, which you know, was not true. It was really, I think, designed to just sort of placate um, the crowd because um, they had shown up at the jail. They were expecting a lynching. Uh, they, uh, were, they thought, they believed that the Groveland defendants were in the jail. And by the hundreds, they showed up outside the jail and they demanded uh, to get the defendants brought down, which you know, could have easily resulted in a lynching. Uh, Sheriff Willis McCall, smartly enough, uh, was hailed as a hero from, from really pre preventing a lynching. Uh, and the New York Times ran a big story, fast talking sheriff prevents lynching in Lake County, Florida. Um, so he really does kind of start off as a hero in this story, although we all, all obviously know there's something else going on behind the scenes. Um, oh, and here's a, a photograph of an editorial cartoon that appeared in the Orlando Sentinel, probably 48 hours after the allegations. Um, you can see there's four electric chairs um, lined up, the Supreme penalty, the Lake County tragedy. I mean, the Lake County tragedy at this point, it hasn't even you know, gone to trial yet and already they're, they're, they're calling for blood. Um, and this was one of the things that really poisoned the jury pool in central Florida was you know, this call for blood, describing it as a tragedy. Um, and and this, this is the kind of media um, that was happening at the time. And, and later on, interestingly enough, the Orlando Sentinel eventually apologized for their coverage of the Groveland story saying that um, they were really way too close to the law enforcement and the prosecutors uh, by really expressing just as much bias as, as the sheriff uh, and, and the judge in this case was, was, um, was you know, demonstrating. And so they've apologized for their coverage, which I thought was really interesting. I hadn't seen something like that uh, before. Ultimately, you know, I started working on this book and, and I, I remember reading the transcripts and I kept waiting with my, my very first introduction to this, kind of had it in my head that this, this case was very similar to the themes of To Kill a Mockingbird. And here you can see Atticus Finch played by Gregory Peck and he's cross-examining Mayella Yule. He's about to get to the truth of what really happened in this case. And it's a very dramatic moment in the story, the book and the movie. And I, I sort of figured with a similar theme here in Lake County, Thurgood Marshall and these NAACP lawyers, you might have similar drama. And the, and the truth of the matter is, there wasn't anything quite like that. In fact, that sort of reminded me of what the difference between fiction and nonfiction. Thurgood Marshall and his lawyers were told that there was no possible way that you could send an African-American lawyer into the courtroom and have him actually question the word of a white woman. They said that would be the quickest way to inflame 
the 12 white male jurors and to send their clients to the electric chair. And so Marshall and his lawyers knew that that was actually an accurate assessment of what was really acceptable in the day in Lake County at the time. And so they hired um, a white lawyer by the name of Alex Ackerman. Um, no white lawyers wanted this case at all. It was a career ender, but Ackerman's um, father had been on some pretty interesting cases himself. And Ackerman himself had represented um, Virgil Hawkins and four other African-Americans to integrate the University of Florida. So his career was already ruined um, basically in, in central Florida. So he was willing to take this case. Um, you know, he was an interesting person who was willing to look at these cases when at the time there were not a lot uh, of white lawyers who would have taken a case like this to defend African-Americans uh, in such an explosive um, themed case. This is another one of those photographs from Life Magazine. And I'm showing to you this here is because um, I think that this photograph, which never ran by the way, if you know what's happening in this photograph, this is all about white supremacy, even though it doesn't quite look like what we were used to seeing about white supremacy. But if you look in this case, there's a witness by the name of Lawrence Bertoft. He's a 18 year old uh, Lake County resident. He's just, um, enlisted in the army and he's helping out at his father's store. He is the first person to see Norma Paget that morning uh, that she made her accusations. And he describes a scene where he saw her outside walking on the road um, and she, she asked him for some help, asked if the store, if the cafe was open. He let her inside. He said he spent about 15 minutes with her. He said she seemed fairly calm. She was looking for her husband. Um, she didn't say anything about being sexually assaulted. Um, and, and at this point in the conversation, you can see Jesse Hunter, the prosecutor. If you know what's happening in the scene, he's saying, no, Lawrence, that's not at all what happened. Don't you remember? You saw a girl standing outside. She was in a torn dress and she was screaming for help that she had been raped. Don't you remember? And Bertoft is saying, no, that's not at all what happened. You're putting words into my mouth. And you can see the reaction of Sheriff Willis McCall and his very intimidating deputy, James Yates. They're not liking his version of the story. They want Lawrence Bertoff to go along with the state's narrative. Um, other witnesses in the trial have definitely done this, but Bertoff is showing some reluctance. So what does the prosecutor do in this case? They strike Bertoff as a witness and hide him from the defense. So the defense never sees this potentially exculpatory witness. Um, and, and this to me is, is really a, a great moment because, well not a great moment, an important moment I think in, in understanding what's really happening here. Thurgood Marshall had a quote, which I, well, the first time I heard it, I didn't quite understand it. It's a very simple quote, it says racism benefits no one. And I remember hearing that thinking, well, you know, racism has obviously ben benefited quite a few people. Uh, for centuries here in America. I don't quite understand it. And, and what I really began to understand as I was diving into this case was Marshall was really talking about the structure of white supremacy. Clearly, African-Americans bore the brunt of that. But what he was trying to say is, this is no good for white people either. It's gonna corrupt you, it's gonna corrupt the system and depending where you are, you're not gonna be able to maintain your own morals and ethics. And in this case, you can see it in play. Jesse Hunter, Sheriff Willis McCall, representatives of the state are basically asking this witness to lie so that they convict, they can convict and execute African-American defendants. That's basically what it is. And white people were expected to do their duty in this kind of a story. And when they didn't, you can see they feel the wrath of the officials, the elected officials. Bertoff was told that they could ruin his father's cafe, run him out of town. Um, he had a conversation with his mother right before this photograph was taken. And she said to him, Lawrence, just tell the truth. Don't worry about us. We'll deal with it later, but don't lie. And that's exactly what he did. He told the truth and he was stricken as a witness and hidden from the defense. So I think that this photograph is really, once you know what's happening in this, it sort of shows you you know, what happens to people like Mabel Norris Reese, the reporter who doesn't necessarily go along with the state's, um, the, with the state's narrative. What happens to witnesses who don't go along? 
uh, for people who are not willing to go along with this uh, white, legalized white supremacy in, in their communities, they often paid a serious price as well. Obviously not as serious as what African-Americans had to endure for decades in this country, um, but clearly it was not sustainable. And that was the point I think Thurgood Marshall was trying to make with that quote about racism benefits no one. I won't really get into the trial too much. It was obviously a miscarriage of justice, but I will want to. I do want to talk about um, the Supreme Court. Thurgood Marshall knew he was never going to win these cases. Oftentimes, he would show up. His only goal was to get an appeal, to take it to a higher level uh, of of court, whether it's uh, you know Florida State Supreme Court or the U.S. Supreme Court. That was their intention because they knew that they were realistic. They knew they were not going to win in these. Um, southern towns with, with a jury and a biased prosecutor and judge. But here you can see the, they, they were managed to successfully appeal it to the Supreme Court. And you can see the African-American lawyers of the NAACP, they're laughing, they're smiling, they know they're going to win here. This is where Marshall felt it was a level playing field. And they had already ruled on cases like this about how grand jurors were selected, um, change of venue for the you know, the poisoning and biasing of the community with the fake confessions and the media coverage. And so that's exactly what happened. Um, they, the, the case was argued before the U.S. Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court threw it out, basically overturned the verdict. Um, Justice Robert Jackson wrote a very powerful opinion in this case um, and concluded, he said, this case presents one of the best examples of one of the worst menaces to American justice. In other words, he was saying, forget about the way the grand jury was selected, forget about the change of venue. This entire case, the entire environment was a, an abomination of American justice on those grounds he was reversing. And so that opinion obviously delighted the families of the Groveland boys um, and delighted the lawyers. But you know, there's somebody, there were people in, in Lake County who were not very pleased, obviously. Um, one of them was the sheriff, Willis McCall. I think the reason for that was by holding off that lynching with the arrest of the Groveland boys, uh, he was making this implicit bargain with the people of the community, um, saying there's not going to be a lynching here. What there's going to be is a fair trial, and then we're going to send those boys to the electric chair. That was the way he looked at it. You know, it, it, the, the trial was never going to be in, in doubt, and we're going to get our deaths. They're just not going to come by an angry mob. They're going to come at the hands of the state. And so once the Supreme Court overturned that verdict, uh, Willis McCall's bargain and, and ability to deliver for the people of, of Lake County uh, was threatened. And so uh, you know, Willis McCall had an idea of his own. Um, and so on the evening of the retrial, because they went to a second trial, Willis McCall decided to go up to Rayford Prison by himself and a deputy and pick up two of the Groveland boys um, and bring them back to trial. And he does that, he handcuffs Walter Irvin, Sam, Sam Shepard, and starts driving back to Lake County. And right before he gets to where the courthouse is, he takes a little detour down a side road and sends his deputy ahead. And this was the result of that little jaunt down the side road um, out near Umatilla. Um, you can see to the left, Samuel Shepard. He was uh, shot three times, killed instantly. Um, next to him, his best friend, Walter Irvin. Irvin is laying there handcuffed to Shepard. Um, he was shot three times as well. Um, what's really interesting about this photograph, I think everything you see in this photograph is basically a lie. Um, you see the you know, sheriff's trademark rumpled Stetson sitting there on the hood of his olds. You can see him standing there, his clothes are ripped and disheveled. He's got a little blood trickling down um, near his eyeglasses, his hair is disheveled. Um, and he's, he's pacing in front of this vehicle saying, I hated to do it, I hated to do it, but they attacked me. They went for my gun and I was outside the car and they started charging me and I emptied my gun. It was either them or me. Um, I was defending myself. And he's, he's talking about this very disturbing narrative. Um, and what's interesting as the witnesses are all standing around watching this, the flash fires from one of the photographers. And as soon as the flash fires, one of the witnesses there says, one of those boys just moved. And in fact, Walter Irvin, who you can see in the middle there, 
was pretending to be dead and drifting in and out of consciousness. And he is laying there handcuffed to his best friend. And now they have to call an ambulance, right? So they call an ambulance, ambulance arrives and takes Willis McCall to the hospital. Because you can see, you know, the extent of his injuries there. Um, the ambulances in Lake County at the time were not permitted to transport African-Americans. So the authorities had to call um, a funeral home, a black funeral home in, in, in Lake County uh, where they sent out a hearse. And the hearse took Sam Shepard to the morgue and took Walter Irvin to the hospital. He arrived about an hour later. And what's interesting, as Walter Irvin uh, arrives at the hospital, he begins to get, um, uh, the word begins to be spreading around uh, the community that he is um, telling a very different story than the one that Willis McCall tells. The doctors are saying that he's talking about the evening he remembers. He has great clarity. And so the following morning, Thurgood Marshall, his lawyers all show up at the hospital uh, in Lake County. And here's a photograph that was taken. You can see Walter Irvin laying there in bed. There's a reporters, the stenographer, there's members of the FBI are there, uh, and Marshall and his lawyers are there, and they're questioning Walter Irvin about the night before. And Irvin saying, he, there was no flat tire. He just got around, opened the door and just opened fire. It was just cold-blooded murder. He shot Sam Shepard three times. The last shot went right uh, between his eyes, killing him instantly. Uh, Irvin says, I'm handcuffed to him. There's nothing I can do. McCall reaches in and drags Sam Shepard out of the car. And Irvin says, I just fell out too. He said, uh, the sheriff then shot him twice, once in the chest and once in the side. Um, and then the story gets truly horrifying. He says, he's laying there, he's not dead yet. He's pretending to be dead. He hears Willis McCall get on the radio and call back his deputy, James Yates to the scene. Then he hears Yates's car, hears the footsteps. And the next thing he knows, he's feeling a flashlight shining over his face and he opens his eyes and he hears the deputy say, this one ain't dead yet. And he sees the deputy point a gun straight down and a flash from the gun. That last bullet went straight through Walter Irvin's neck, but still did not kill him. Um, so he's pretending to be dead. He's laying there, still conscious. He says, he hears them say, we gotta make it look like an escape. And they start tearing at his clothes. They pull some of McCall's hair out of his head, put it in the body of Sam Shepard in his hand. Uh, they rip the clothes. Uh, and, and so they're, they're making this look like an escape attempt. And, and Irvin's saying, why would I escape? I, I just was victorious in the Supreme Court. Thurgood Marshall's my lawyer. I'm not making a run for it while I'm handcuffed. Doesn't make any sense. The FBI is listening to this and they're thinking, well, We've recovered five of the bullets from the bodies of Sam Shepard and Walter Irvin. The sixth bullet that went straight through Irvin's neck, we're never gonna find that because it was not lodged in his body. Um, but they're thinking, according to, to Sheriff Willis McCall's version, they're never gonna find that bullet. He said they were charging at the time. But they say, if Walter Irvin's telling the truth, we have an idea where that sixth bullet might be. And so the FBI rushes back to the crime scene from the night before, and they find the blood spots about 10 inches wide. And that's where Walter Irvin was laying the night before. And they start digging down with a little shovel beneath that blood spot. And 10 inches below the surface of that soil, they find a 38 caliber bullet directly below the blood spot. And right away, the FBI knows that Willis McCall is lying, that this is cold-blooded murder. Now they have forensic evidence to back up Walter Irvin's version of the story. Um, and they write a report that's absolutely damning. It's encouraging prosecution of McCall and his deputy for murder and attempted murder. Remarkably, the story goes nowhere. The case goes nowhere. Uh, the U.S. attorney in Tampa, Herbert Phillips, a known segregationist himself, um, declines to go forward with this case against the sheriff and the deputy. And the judge, Truman Futch, in Lake County, says because the coroner's jury was so efficient and so thorough in their investigation, and because they found that Sheriff Willis McCall was defending himself that evening, there's no need to impanel a grand jury with any of this evidence. 
because the coroner's jury did such a thorough job. Um, you know, tragically, it was Sheriff Willis McCall who picked his own coroner's jury. Um, he picked friends and associates, and naturally they did what was expected of them. They did what many of the witnesses in the trial did that was expected of them. Um, and they did the thing that that one witness in the cafe, uh, Lawrence Bertoff, would not do. They, would, they went along with this. They knew what their responsibility was in the community. And I ended up interviewing um, one of the um, members of the coroner's jury. And he, I asked him about it, he just kind of shrugged his shoulders and said, Willis McCall was a dangerous man. And um, we knew it was expected of us, basically. Um, the, these reports, when I filed the Freedom of Information Act, I was the first person to, to see these files that were sealed. Um, Thurgood Marshall and his lawyers never saw this evidence. Um, really, people often ask me what I think is the most disturbing aspect of this entire story, and I, I believe it's this. Um, one of the FBI agents wrote in a report, he was told that all of this was quashed for four words, tranquility of the South. In other words, if people really knew what was happening behind the scenes, they might riot in the streets. Um, and so this was entirely quashed for to prevent some kind of racial uprising. It's really just um, shocking in many ways. One of the people I mentioned, Mabel Norris Reese, the writer, she was a reporter. Her and her husband owned the Mount Dora Topic. Um, it was a small weekly newspaper in Lake County. And Mabel Norris Reese is really interesting because you know, in the beginning, she's really friendly with the prosecutor, Jesse Hunter. Um, she's getting the sheriff's version of things and she's printing them at verbatim, basically. Uh, and then she begins to realize slowly, and once the Groveland um, defendants were shot on the side of the road, she begins to really take a turn and starts saying, this is wrong. I'm going to start reporting on injustice. And, and because of her actions, she ends up, her dog gets poisoned and killed. Um, her house is bombed. Uh, she's basically run out of town, threatened constantly. Um, and this was the reaction because her reporting now was focusing on the wrongdoing and civil rights violations that were happening in Lake County. And because that did not go over so well in Lake County, she was basically chased out of town. Um, she went to work, in, moved, had to move to Daytona and work, went, worked for the Daytona Beach News Journal. And she's a really important uh, part of the story. Um, just a, a remarkable, courageous uh, individual who had a very significant change of heart. One of the things I you know, often talk about is, um, this is Harry T. Moore and his wife, Harriet. He was the executive secretary of the NAACP in Florida. Uh, so the most powerful NAACP executive in the state. And Thurgood Marshall had worked with him in the past and he knew how efficient and effective he was um, at getting the word out, putting pressure on the media and politicians uh, in this Groveland case. And his job was to really put pressure on Willis McCall um, and get the story out there about the, the shooting. And, 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 and he became a real thorn in Willis McCall's side. And on Christmas Eve, Christmas night of 1951, on the evening of the retrial, the Ku Klux Klan puts a bomb underneath the, the home of Harry T. Moore and his wife, Harriet, um, killing them. Um, they basically became the first martyrs of this modern civil rights movement. And they're not really well known. I mean, everybody is familiar with the name Medgar Evers. He was, he was only a field secretary in Mississippi. Here we have the head of the NAACP in Florida, um, responsible for registering more than 100,000 African-Americans onto the voting rolls pretty much changed the, the, the political landscape of Florida. And now he's working with Thurgood Marshall on this Groveland case, it's getting national attention. And on the evening of the retrial, he's killed in his home by the Klan. Um, this case was still largely unsolved. Um, most FBI officials, um, agents, tend to believe it was related to the Groveland story. Um, and that, in fact, that's what Harriet believed herself. She, she stayed alive for almost a week after her husband's death and spoke openly about this and the threats that they were receiving at the time. And, uh, you know, they went forward with a second trial, again, another, um, you know, miscarriage of justice. And I like to show this photograph because there's a young white man in the middle. And sometimes I think we look at these cases as if they're ancient history. 
in a lot of ways. And they, they don't, the legal system doesn't quite look like what we know of it today. Granted, it's not perfect. It's got, still has its problems in criminal justice. But if you look back to the 40s and 50s in the Jim Crow South, um, the, the ju- you barely recognize the justice system. Um, and, and so sometimes this feels like ancient history. Well, Jack Greenberg was alive at the time I was writing this book. I was able to interview him um, and he remembered it very clearly. And he said, you know, I stormed the beaches of Iwo Jima uh, off a ship. Uh, I was more scared in Lake County than I was in Iwo Jima. Uh, I, I was terrified. And he said, I felt guilty because I'm white and I don't even live here. I can't imagine what it must have been like for the people like Harry T. Moore uh, and people like Paul Perkins, who you can see seated next to Jack Greenberg, who you know is a young lawyer who just stayed in the Central Florida community um, doing a lot of civil rights law. The threats and the violence that they faced, they're the ones who really put themselves at risk. I, Greenberg said, I got on the train and went back to New York and I could feel safe. But the people who stayed in these battlefields doing this work are the real heroes of this story. Um, and Thurgood Marshall also talked about that. You know, he went on the road um, talking about, um, you know, the importance uh, of these kind of cases. And he, he would often read the testimony of, of Walter Irvin from that hospital room describing what had happened to him that night. Um, this just cold-blooded murder and attempted murder. And... Marshall was able to raise a significant amount of money on the back of this Groveland case. And interestingly enough, they didn't really even need the money anymore because the case was practically almost done. And so I think it was $100,000 came in from all over the country, donated to the NAACP. Marshall was able to roll most of that money into the Brown versus uh, Board case that he was working on at the same time. Um, And that enabled him to really put the resources uh, and, and legal resources into that Brown case that you know, they'd never really been able to do before. Uh, now they were a well-funded organization. And I think it's why Brown was so successful. And, and the, the Brown brief is one of the most impressive civil rights documents. If you ever get a chance to read it, I, I highly recommend it. Um, but that was really made possible by the attention of what was happening in central Florida at the time. So much money came in that Marshall was able to raise it and move it right over into Brown versus Board. And I'll just end up you know, talking a, a little bit about this. Um, a couple of years ago, I got a call from um, some people in Florida who were politically connected. And they told me that there was um, a claims bill that had been filed uh, in Florida to seek com- some kind of relief for the, for the gross injustice of this case and um, began to gain some momentum. Interestingly, it started uh, you know, w- in a book club basically where a couple of uh, representatives read it and said, we should we should do a bill to, to get some kind of relief for the Groveland boys. Um, and they started it. And then some of their Republican counterparts in, 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 representatives, um, they, they were reading the book too. And, and they said that we're gonna have a competition to see who can have more uh, co-sponsors of this bill. So it was this very friendly um, bipartisan effort that came and I got a call saying, you should come down here. I think this bill is gonna pass. And so I went down to Tallahassee uh, a couple of years ago and sure enough, um, seated up in the balcony with a lot of the families from the Groveland Four, and they took a vote. And it was 117 to nothing, um, the House of Representatives. Uh, all of them agreed to co-sponsor the bill. A week later, the Florida Senate did the same thing unanimously. I think it was 36, 38 to nothing. Um, voted um, for relief for pardoning the Groveland Four. And you know, it was really amazing to be up there with the families to see uh, you know, these representatives all put their hand over their heart, turned to the balcony, and basically said, on behalf of the state of Florida, we apologize for this gross injustice. And they have moved towards the exonerations, which I turned over all my uh, records to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, to the Florida Attorney General's Office. Um, and that's in progress. I think we should be hearing something very soon on that. I have no idea which, which way it's going. But I thought, to me, this was a great moment in, in Florida government. Um, the way that, in a bipartisan fashion, people got together and said, we need to correct the past for the integrity of the courts, for the integrity of Florida and its history. If we just ignore these stories and sweep them under the rugs when they're obviously gross injustices, um, 
it's not great for the integrity of our state. And so they got together and, and did this. And I thought it was really inspiring. You don't see a lot of it uh, in many of the other states that have really, you know, some of those cotton belt states that had a great deal of, of racial terrorism. Um, I haven't seen the kind of recognition and accountability that the state of Florida uh, did in this particular case. And I, I find it really inspiring that the bipartisan effort, and I think a lot of it springs from the way Thurgood Marshall argued this case. He really argued these kinds of cases from a patriotic standpoint, saying we all believe in the Constitution. We need to live up to the writing of the Constitution, to the content, and, and saying, you know, these kind of atrocities just are not acceptable. They, they shouldn't be acceptable to us as Americans if we believe in the Constitution. And, and so, you know, I think really a, a lot of what happened, I think, was channeled through Thurgood Marshall and his lawyers and the work that they put in. And a lot of them were local Florida attorneys who also believed in this case, who worked with the NAACP um, to sort of try to get justice. They never really saw it in their lifetime. But I think it's encouraging to see that, you know, to me, a lot of it is really the power of storytelling in a lot of ways. You know, if, and this is a strange point to think about, but I think it has a lot of current relevance. Um, you know, I think if you look at what happened this summer with the George Floyd case, those cell cameras, in a lot of ways, the cell cameras make it possible to look at these things more clearly. Um, and when you see these images close up and you see what's happening, doesn't really reflect, I think, the, that kind of America that we believe we wanna live in. Uh, and so when we see those kind of images, you know, I shudder to think if Walter Irvin had, had died on the side of that road, as he should have, he really should have died, no one would ever have heard of this case. This would you, this be another one of those lost cases. But because Walter Irvin survived and it was able to tell a different story and bring attention to this shooting by the side of the road and the atrocities and the, and the violence and the bombings of Harry T. Moore, we were able to look at this um, with, with a, a record that exists. But a lot of times when I look at these cases, um, they, they just, the, there's no records anymore. Um, they've just been lost to history because there's just no documentation. But that photograph of Willis McCall standing by the two bodies um, uh, and, and the record that exists after that shooting, in a lot of ways, it created a forensic record that was similar to what we see now with these cell phone cameras. And it brought a great deal of attention onto this case that normally wouldn't be there. And so, you know, while clearly pardons are not going to bring anybody back to life, I can tell you that the families of the Grolin Four think it's an important gesture because, you know, they've lived, many of them stayed in Lake County, they've lived with the shadow of a false narrative. That false narrative being that their relatives sexually assaulted a local girl and then they tried to escape from prison and attacked a member of law enforcement. That official narrative has really hung over their heads and, and they say that just clearing their names um, was so important to them to just have the official narrative be different. Um, and so that I think is one of the great moments in Florida government, I believe, and a, a really I don't want to say a happy ending to this case. It's not quite over yet. Still waiting for the exonerations, but a hopeful ending. And so I'll end it right about there and I'll, I'll open it up to questions. Hello, Gilbert King. Hello, thank you for coming. I'm Sandra Parks. I'm Stetson Kennedy's wife. I know your voice. I just didn't know your face. So nice to meet you. Well, I come to you with three important thanks. First is the detail with which you told Stetson's story in uh, Devil in the Grove. Uh, I've heard that story hundreds of times, and you did a, it, you had a letter perfect. Uh, Stetson would thoroughly approve of the way you represented the story, I including the fact that he had spilled whiskey all down the front of him before he met uh, Thurgood Marshall. So thank you. <laughs> You know, it's funny, I just say that, that the personal side, like, I think it's really important to humanize people like Thurgood Marshall and Stetson Kennedy. You know, they're not perfect human beings. Nobody is. And I think that's why a lot of people relate to this. People are trying to do their best. They have great ideals. But, you know, that like, 
things happen in life. Thurgood Marshall liked to drink a little bit. He definitely liked to get out there and 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 meet women, and 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 that was you know part of his legacy. And to sort of shy away from that, I, I think I think it adds, it makes um, these people who are really committed to the cause of civil rights much more um, lively, in my point of view. So I, I just I I just. Stetson Kennedy, I was so happy that I had a chance to meet him um, and, and he talked to me and I, I really will not forget a lot of the things he told me because it was from a lifetime of education. Well, the second thing we have th to be thankful for is the attention that Devil in the Grove brought to Harry T. Moore. Uh, Stetson spent the rest of his life trying to get justice for Harry T. Moore. Uh, in, uh, on April the 5th of 2006, I drove him to Charlie Crist's office, who was uh, at time, Charlie Crist was the Attorney General of Florida, to reopen the case. He actually contacted Eric Holder after Eric Holder became uh, the Attorney General to bump the Harry Moore case up on the coal file list because he was so committed to it. On on August the 7th, 2011, Stetson was stricken. And as he was being carried out of the house for the last time for his last ride that he fully knew was happening, he pointed to the Harry Moore file and he said, Sandra, don't let them forget about Harry Moore. Well, I'm grateful that the Florida Historical Society continues to make before his time, but you gave a larger audience for Harry T. Moore than anything Stetson Kennedy could ever have done. So thank you, thank you. Thank you, Sandra. But the third thing I have to be thankful to you for has to do with the attention that you brought to Mabel Reese. In 1952, I lived in Mount Dora and I was a classmate of Pat Reese. And as a Southern girl who understood what the Klan was about, uh, I used to walk from school with Pat down to downtown Mount Dora and, uh, and, and heard the tales of men following her in trucks and what had happened to her and her family. Uh, Stetson also knew Mabel Reese. Uh, in addition to her, her fight for justice for the Groveland Four, for Jesse Daniels, for the Platt family. Mabel, Me Mabel Reese was the reporter from the Daytona paper that gave a better account of the 1964 public accommodations riots in St. Augustine, including Dr. King's time there, than any other journalist ever. Our family is committed to seeing to it that M Mabel Reese is adequately honored in the Florida Women's Hall of Fame. There has been one effort to do that, it hasn't happened. It didn't happen. Uh, I'm I'm hopeful of working with people in Ma in Lake County to make that happen. So any suggestions you would have or people that you could contact to help us bring attention to this woman, while her fight for justice is one thing. In the life of every Southerner of my generation who became a civil rights activist, there is that question: What made you do it? What made you change? from what your, your parents and the society around you thought you should believe. And my association with Pat was one little break in that narrative that changed what I would do with my life and certainly the man that I married. So I have, I have a, a very personal reason to hope that we can let this woman who fought for justice for, with terrible, terrible uh, consequences for her family. So thank you, thank you, and thank you. Oh, that, that was lovely, Sandra. And, and just so you know, I'm very involved with the uh, Women's Hall of Fame in Florida, working about uh, getting Mabel. I've written letters. Um, I'm talking to people. And uh, we have, a, by the way, a statue is going up very soon I know. Uh, to Mabel Morris Reese, Reese in Mount Dora. So hopefully I'm going to be down there. I hope you will be too, because I would love to meet you. Count on it. Thank you. Thanks, Sandra. I'm Holly Baker. I'm the archivist Hello. here. Very nice to meet you. I read Devil in the Nice Grove. to meet you, Holly. I wanted to ask you, just because you've been uh, looking into this topic for so long, between 1877 and 1950, 
Florida had the highest cap per capita rate of lynchings than any other state in the U.S. And I was just wondering, why do you think Florida has such a terrible distinction? Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, it, it really is. It, it, one of the things that, you know, you learn when you're writing about this period, Florida at the time was the most dangerous state to be black in. It had the highest per capita rate of lynching. I personally think there's something to the fact that when we think of civil rights and we think of Jim Crow, we often think of the Cotton Belt South, you know, Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana. Um, and so when you see civil rights covered, it's often in those states. Florida, for some reason, was not considered the South. It was considered South of the South. And I, I've talked to historians about this and, and try to get an explanation. I think it was I, I think it was Florida flew off the radar a little bit. And what, what really, if you think about it, this Groveland story should have, everyone in America should have known this. If, if we all are all familiar with the Scottsboro Boys, which didn't have any deaths, um, and that occurred in Alabama in 1931, why are we not familiar with the Groveland story, which had, you know, basically five people were killed. Um, you have Thurgood Marshall, the first African-American future Supreme Court justice, in charge of the trial, um, it's an extraordinarily dramatic case. If you you know if you've read the book, you know it is. It's filled with danger and 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 atmosphere. And and why do we not know about this? I looked through all of Thurgood Marshall's biographies, and the Groveland case, at best, was given like a couple paragraphs. Um, in civil rights literature, it's just unknown. And I try to like ask people. Some people told me that they thought because of Leroy Collins becoming the governor in the early 50s, that, that was, he was seen as a progressive governor. So when, when, a, when a civil rights atrocity happened, people just automatically, well, that's, that's Florida. That's not really, you won't report that the same way if a civil rights thing happened in you know, Connecticut, it doesn't quite get the kind of attention because it's not part of that Jim Crow. And it was wrong. I mean, Florida was a part of the South and, and it should have been covered but just things just tend to fall off the radar. Um, there's another story that I wrote about that happened in, in Live Oak. And it was a story of um, a young, like 14, 14 or 15 year old kid who worked in a drugstore and swept the floors there. And at Christmas, he wrote a Christmas card to a 15 year old white cashier. And when she showed the Christmas card to her father, her father got some you know, friends together and basically lynched this kid. Uh, uh, Willie Howard was his name in Live Oak in 1944. And nobody knows about this case. Even in Florida, people are, are not really aware of it when I go around talking about it. But yet everyone's heard about Emmett Till because that happened in Mississippi 10 years later. Um, and, and so I was just shocked that you could have a lynching of a child and it still not get any investigation by the Department of Justice, didn't really get any media attention. Um, and so that's my best explanation for why we don't know about Florida's past and its history. But, um, you know, hopefully things are starting to change. I really find like no shortage of stories down in Florida. Um, you know, the next book I'd written, Beneath the Ruthless Sun, was another case. Believe me, as a writer, the last thing I wanted to do was go back into Lake County and tell a story about Willis McCall. Uh, it, you know, these things, this is five years of my life. Five years of me like showing up at the dinner table with my family, telling Willis McCall stories. You know, I, I think it was just pure torture for my family. And now I have this new book, and it's going to require another five years. And at first, I thought, well, I, I think I'm just going to make Willis McCall sort of a, a minor player in the story, until I started investigating and found out that he was heavily, heavily involved in this story again. Um, so I've spent, you know. 10 years of my life focused on Lake County justice and law enforcement. And um, there's no shortage of stories. And I would probably say Willis McCall was the worst sheriff in terms of civil rights violations that I've come across. Um, you know, right next to him, there was a, a sheriff by the name of Dave Starr in uh, Orlando, Orange County. Um, Dave Starr was openly in the Klan. He used to lead the Klan parades. Um, and yet he did not get investigated for these brutalities and, 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 and racial uh, civil rights violations and 
killings uh, the way Willis McCall did. And sometimes people talk about Bull Connor. We remember with the fire hoses and the dogs in, in, in Alabama. Uh, you know, I, I think I said this in, in a quote, like uh, Bull Connor was like Barney Fife compared to Sheriff Willis McCall. And Willis McCall was extraordinarily dangerous. Um, and, and Bull Connor was a bully and a, and, a, and a tyrant, but he was not the kind of person who was going to be killing people with his bare hands the way Sheriff Willis McCall was. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I think when I travel around Florida, in, in the same way that I talk about Florida's really violent past, I also make sure that I mention it's also done more, I think, to, you know, recognize a lot of these atrocities and to sort of hold itself accountable than many other states, uh, southern states. So hello, I don't have a question. My name is Sonia Millard and I'm the Cultural Center Coordinator to Harry T. Moore Cultural Center in MIMS, Florida. So I wanna first say thank you um, for the book, Devil in the Grove, because we get so many visitors that come. And I also just wanna mention that our president of our board of directors that I wanna pull them up here, Mr. William Gary is here, Ms. Cassandra Wright. And we really just like to thank you. I'm not sure, I've been there six years now and I'm not sure if you came out to visit us, but when you come to Florida, to see Ms. Parks, I would love for you to stop by the Harry T. Moore Cultural Center in MEMS and come visit us. I would love to. I've been there several times. I probably didn't introduce myself because I'm just walking through the museum oh, yeah. and walking okay. through the house, but I will next time. Um, what was the name of your board of director again? Mr. William Gary. Would you, can you come up, Bill? <laughs> He's the president of our board of directors, and he has worked tremendously and tirelessly at the Harry T. Moore Center, and I want him to say a few words. Mr. Gary, oh. did I meet you in Montgomery? Did you uh, show up for the Harry T. Moore? Yes, uh, and I was gonna mention that to you, Mr. King. Um, when I traveled to uh, Montgomery to the East Coast Justice uh, Initiative and, and went through the exhibit there, one of the hanging uh, slabs that I photographed was of a man named James Clark who was lynched in O'Galley, Florida here in 1926, July of 1926. And, and my question to you is, um, I've read a little bit about that incident, uh, but I haven't been able to find much more about uh, Mr. Clark. Uh, supposedly he was a chauffeur for a traveling salesman, a white traveling salesman, and they were staying at a hotel there in O'Galley. Uh, Mr. Clark, who is black, was accused of raping the hotel owner's daughter, a white girl. Uh, he was put in jail, uh, no trial. The police chief supposedly took him out of the jail and was gonna take him to another safe location because he had gotten word that there was a mob of white men who was gonna come and take him from the jail. And supposedly on the way to the other location, the police chief uh, was stopped by a group of white guys who took Mr. Clark out of the car and lynched him in O'Galley on a, on a street named Lynching Lane. Uh, but uh, I haven't been able to find out much more about you know, Mr. Clark, his background, where he was from, or any of his family. Uh, I've heard though that there are still some living witnesses to that incident. And I was just wondering if you maybe have run across that incident in your research. You know, I, I remember, I definitely remember coming across it. I think I experienced the same kind of frustration, like, why do I not know more about this? Right. And sometimes that's the problem with these cases. A lot of them just die off. If they don't get any kind of, um, and you need more than media coverage. You need a civil rights investigation. Usually in the 1920s, they weren't doing them. And so everything was resolved in the courts, so the local courts. And, you know, one of the things I find just, absolutely stunning to me is that, you know, back in the day, you could be accused of a crime like this if you weren't lynched and you were taken to trial. If you couldn't afford, you know, to have transcripts done, you wouldn't get transcripts. Right. You'd get like two paragraph summary by the clerk. And now there's nothing to appeal because those clerks knew exactly how to write them. So there's no appealable issues. And so that's what happens with a lot of these lynchings and a lot of these um, cases where people are just sent right to the electric chair. There's not a lot of record to really look into them. Um, you'd have to go down and try to find relatives, try to piece the story together that way. 
but I promise you this, I'm going to look into it again now that you mentioned it. Mm -hmm. And I, I know I can probably find you through the museum, right? Through the right. Oh, yes. Um, the, um, I, I don't think the local paper covered it, which is another thing that would happen during those cases. You, I'm sure you're familiar with Axe Handle Saturday that happened in Jacksonville, uh, and the local Times Union paper editor told his reporters not to cover that, but uh, some other out-of-town reporters did, and so we got to know about what actually happened on that Saturday. So if you do find out anything about it, I'd be interested in knowing a little bit about Mr. Clark and, and his background. Thank you. I promise you I'll do that. In fact, I'll do it as soon as I hang up from, from this talk, and I'm going to look into it, because sometimes when I go, I'm like, I should know more about that. Okay, all right. But I'll email you a link. I promise you I'll do this. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, nice meeting you. Nice seeing you again. Hi, my name is Angela McHugh. I'm with the Roster House Museum and Gardens. And one of the things we have had an issue with is something you kind of touched on here, which is documentation. Because we've really wanted to look into some of our stuff, and ours goes back a little further. Um, we do know that there were slaves on our property, but we're not even positive of their names. So I was kind of wondering, when you got started with either of these books, what sort of documents were at your disposal? Because you mentioned a lot that you found along the way, and how did that really influence what you ended up writing? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Usually, usually I try to start by just trying to find out anything I can find in the newspapers. And if I can just read everything that's available in newspapers, now I have some sense of where things happened, who might have been involved. Um, when I when I go in and select these stories, one of the things I try to look for is either a trial or uh, legal records, because if I have lawyers who are interviewing all the witnesses, um, it's a great way to start. And, and, and a lot of times I'll find stories that I think are absolutely amazing, and I don't have that kind of documentation. All I have is, is like a couple stories in a newspaper and maybe a couple accounts from you know some living witnesses, but those are usually not very thorough and they're relying on memory. Um, I, I do a lot through the Freedom of Information Act requests that I file um, to get, like, usually I, I want FBI investigations. If I can find those, then I have like all these present day accounts. Um, and, and people generally do not do not lie to the FBI because an FBI agent will say, look, we're, we're not looking for you, but if you lie to us, that's gonna be a problem. So just tell the truth about what you know. And that's, and usually you get a very accurate record based on that. Um, you know, people will lie to media people a little easier, which you have to be a little bit careful about. But, you know, going through that, another thing I, I find like going through the NAACP records, um, a lot of times like you'll have complaints and, and documentation by local officials and they're trying to get the national NAACP involved. And so they do all this local reporting and affidavits and, and documents and send them up to the New York office. And if they're kept there, I can look through and track it. But it's, it's a very frustrating thing. I will say Florida is really good about it. Florida has a really great records preservation system. Sunshine laws really help. So in a way, I, I, I like to say I stick to Florida because there's so many really interesting stories and I just love Florida. But um, it's, it's a frustrating endeavor, especially when you're talking about going back uh, looking at slave documents, um, you know, sometimes some of the churches kept a lot of records. And, and then what you find, like, I found this in Louisiana, was like, you know, the Union troops would come down and just burn everything. And so a lot of the records disappear that way. Um, it, it's a really frustrating effort. And the further you go back, but I have to say, there's more and more um, things that are coming up. I don't generally focus on times that old. So I don't really know as much that's available. But I know like I have a, a writer friend that I know is doing a, a, a look at Georgetown University and they're, they're make, taking advantage of slave labor. And she's been able to go back into that um, and, and find out a lot of information. I think that book should be coming out. I don't know exactly when, but the writer's name is Rachel Swarns. And I think she's writing it in a way that she'll t talk about how she was able to research it and how she was able to piece things together for this story. Um, and so that might be something to look for because I, I guarantee you she will know a lot more about um, going further back in time to check like genealogy and, and land records um, to sort of piece together a story that, that far back. So hopefully that's helpful, but I would definitely look for that book. Before we wrap, I just want to thank everybody, but also remind you that our the Florida Historical Society 2021 annual meeting and symposium will be held in October. 
on the campus of the University of Central Florida. It'll be held in conjunction with the Gerald Schaffner Lecture on Florida History and Culture. And it's not too late to mark your calendars for the 2022 Florida Historical Society Public History Forum, which will be held in Gainesville. We'll be in the Hilton on the campus of the University of Florida, where we will have uh, roundtable discussions in the morning and then go out and tour historic sites. We'll have our awards luncheon and our banquet speaker. Our, uh, we will have another great keynote speaker uh, like we had today with, with Gilbert King. So uh, thank you uh, for being here on the internet as part of our virtual uh, public history forum. Thank you so much for the live audience for being here. It's so great to have people back in the museum. And most of all, thank you, Gilbert King, for such an outstanding presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it.